Hey guys, I'm Richard Fitzgerald. This is Dubai Works, where we interview the business leaders making a difference in this great city. That business with scalability was very interesting to me. I like building something that has legacy. Good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Dubai Works Business Podcast. This week, I had the pleasure of being joined by Katie Harvey. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Katie is the co-founder of QComs. Q Communications is an international communications agency uh, based in Dubai, and they are actually celebrating their 10-year uh, anniversary this year. So they're actually they're based in Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and London, and London, Manchester, specializing in fully integrated PR, social media, influencer marketing. And now, as I said, 10 years in business with clients such as Aldar Properties, Reebok, Hyatt, to name a few. Qcoms, uh, Qcoms is something Katie set up with her business partner, Elsa. Yeah, Elsa. Elsa. Like Frozen. <laughs> like Frozen. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't watched those movies, actually. Um, and she joins us today to tell the story. We're going to discuss female leadership in business, uh, expanding the business during a global pandemic, uh, and also just the general story of QCOMs. Welcome again. Great. Thank you for having <laughs> and me. And yeah, here. we've known each other for about five five years or so. Yeah, I remember when we first met and then um, I feel like I've been with you on the, the love and journey, the yeah, Augustus yeah, yeah. journey and just going on and on. Yeah, because um, I, I, remember, I remember I was working with a techie startup yeah. and I, I was working with a, guy, with a founder and thinking that they that we needed some PR help. So I spoke to you about it. Yeah. And that's the first I'd known of you, but obviously you were here a long time before. it. Yeah, so we started QComs or Q Communications in 2010, but I myself have been here since 2007. And um, Elsa, my business partner, has been here a bit longer. I won't give away too much. Um, <laughs> she won't forgive me for that. And yeah, so, so we started the agency then. Um, it was two of us. And we actually started as... Um, DubaiPartyQueen.com. Okay. And it's actually a handle I've kept on Instagram. That's your Instagram account. It, okay. It's more of a just like nostalgic. I really don't live up to the name anymore. Did you at the time? <laughs> at the time I did, but I was, you was know, this, 10 uh, years younger. Okay. And this was post pre 2008. So it was Dubai a party place at the time? Oh my gosh. Very much so. But when I joined Dubai, I came and worked with the Moven Pick hotel and uh, group and they only had one hotel at the time down in bird dubai and that's where jimmy dix was it was opposite chi so people like tim Derry, greg dufton everyone you know we we're all part of the little community they were working doing their thing then too who've then gone on to create such amazing things yeah, yeah. and um yeah i think earning five thousand dirhams a month for Two, three years. And we always then, remember our early salaries, don't we? Oh like my when, gosh, we when we start out, no matter what country or currency it's in. You remember <laughs> it so well. And yeah. I always look back and think, gosh, I did really well on that. You know? yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> were things cheaper? Do you remember? Or you were just younger? Less... I think I was quite the hustler. So, you know, you used your network. <laughs> I was working in house and hotels doing comms. Yeah. So we had a brilliant um, hotel PR network then. So we used to kind of just reach out and lean on each other. Yeah. And that's actually how myself and Elsa met um we became fast friends very quickly and then it was more a thing of it was real boom times then and then yeah i was going through obviously the then the global uh, recession happened and we were looking for ways to subsidize our income hmm. because we just kind of felt that there were people um, in real estate cowboys i will say it and a lot of people who were earning big bucks and we didn't think had half the contacts we had or or half the determination so we started to buy party queen very much as uh, an events company but more along the line of baby showers and um, hen parties and there was a real need for it in the market here yeah then. I yeah mean, um, but once we decided to go for it, I mean gosh we were baking cupcakes I'm sure we broke every rule in the book then with HACCP and food hygiene and wow. and but we just went for it yeah. you know like taking over a spa on the weekend and then selling it on as a package to people and hosting it. Were there free zones then? It's obviously not that long ago, but were you able to set up a business? Was it hard? Did you just kind of go as you... It was hard, but we set up with Virtuson actually way back when hmm. under Dubai Party Queen. 
So when we launched, that's how we did it. I quit my job first and then Elsa stayed in hers um, for about six months longer just because mm. so we had a little bit of security and she was earning more than me, which obviously wasn't that hard at the time. And um, the second people realized that we were free agents as such, um, people started to approach us to do PR. Yeah. which is our background, which is my background and Elsa's background. She's more marketing and PR. Why didn't you do a PR agency from the start? Because we first just done it and thought about what our passion is. Yeah. Um, and thought it's something that was a bit of fun. And mm. then thought, actually, if you want to do this correctly, and we learned that very quickly, we're going to have to jump in with two feet. Yeah. So, which is why we went down the event side. Also, I think there might have been false senses of grandeur around an events company, which is not the case. whatsoever you um, thought this was going to be fun all the time I think so you <laughs> yeah. know I was like I love going to events so yeah. why don't I just do it all the time <laughs> and then people started to approach us and um, having a PR agency is actually something that's been a dream of mine since a very young age my mother actually found my cover letter for university the like a few weeks back and wow. in it I said how I want to open a PR agency no I've way. even forgotten about it um, so did, what it did you study in, in university was it really PR okay, okay. Like relations. It's, probably, it's part of my pitch to get in I think but just a question on that like do you think uh, sometimes in starting a business I, I remember when I was thinking of social media agencies even though you're doing it and you're good at it and you study this mm. you think that actually running an agency might be harder you need something extra special so you set up something else you don't know anything about it I think so. Um, I think it's always, everyone thinks that they can maybe do an agency, but it's, it's a lot tougher, no matter what type of, yeah. of industry it is. Um, I just don't think we were focused. I don't think the idea then was we were going to start a business that was going to be have a 10-year legacy and go on and go international. It really was just a bit of fun. And I know I probably shouldn't be saying that, but that's the reality of how it was born. Then when people were starting to approach us saying, would you like to, or can you look at this project? It was very much in hospitality because that's where our strengths um, lay at the time. We'd say, yes, of course, because as you know, when you start up a business, you really, you, in, yeah. you, really, you grab everything yeah. with two hands. The reality sets in very quickly, um, yeah. especially when there's no safety net there. We didn't have investors. It was just the two of us working out of a, a sitting room um, driving a car that, didn't have AC so we'd show up to Proper meetings startup. early yeah. <laughs> I know it sounds like quite the Cinderella story but I think it's really good to remember those things and, and it keeps you very humble and grounded so when you're speaking to people or if, or if you have um, requests to remember that nothing's ever above you you know or you're never above anything should I say hmm. and um, that you can relate to people and be like right now you need to get your hands dirty And then it just, it kind of snowballed and like PR is our passion. So that's, I think, what really came through. So as much as we might have liked the idea of doing events, what we were really good at was communicating. Yeah. So that's what started to come more and more to the forefront. That's what we were getting more referrals on. And it just started to make a lot more sense. And when did the baby shower stop? When did it go from Dubai Party Queen I'd say about cars. eight months in, nine months in, because we were kind of doing the two in tandem, and then it just naturally phased out. But yeah. I think we're still the go-to yeah. among our social circles, okay. anything. <laughs> but we took part of that element into the business. And I think about on year four or five, we did another big investment into events and brought in a third party, and it didn't work. I think that's the real thing here, too. You can have a plan, write plans. But you have to be so ready to let go of those plans as well and make quick decisions mm. and like pivot as things are thrown at you. I think the last yeah. six months is a great example of that. Um, but so we, we'll get back to that and then also yeah. touch on the, the, the pivot into events. But so how did it how did it start to snowball? Like, you know, where, where you because what we see now and QCOMs and how established you are, as I said at the start, but. Uh, the clients that you work for, how professional, the size of the company. Mm. It looks like an agency that was, you know, set up to be legit and to be big time from the start. Yeah. Is this, is this piece by piece? Or? Uh, it, it's a combination of piece by piece and it's a combination of confidence and, and big picture thinking. I think the second we realized, oh wait, this isn't a weekend kind of add-on subsidized income this is an agency it shifted something okay. in our minds yeah and then from day one Focus. we've always been it very much focused us and we always said okay how big can we take this 
Mm. A lot of people ask us, okay, so what's your exit plan? Are you planning to sell? Are you building it up to sell? Is that why you're now going international? And I've always said no. Like we are, well, you know, the plan. We want to get bigger and bigger and try and make it work as long mm. as it makes sense. Yeah. You know, the idea of having to answer to someone else doesn't necessarily appeal to us. Yeah. We've done it our way since day So day one. the passion, you know, the, the PR agency is similar uh, to how other marketing services companies would be in that they might start up as independent and then an exit uh, or a sell could be to one of the big holding groups. Mm. Is, is that something... you know, that, that you look at or do you prefer being, as you said, independent? I think we prefer being independent. Um, so we opened up an office in Abu Dhabi in 2016. So we were six years into operation at that stage. And that was a brilliant move for us. It really changed things up, especially on getting some of those larger um, brands and international contracts. And for those that work in Abu Dhabi, no, it's a completely different market. Mm. And, you know, people and businesses in Abu Dhabi want to work with businesses in Abu Dhabi, not someone who um, resides and, and lives and breathes Dubai and then does the 45-minute drive once a week and thinks that's, that's it. So I think what we really look at is really investing when we make those next steps into the community and making sure we're part of it so we can actually bring value mm. to the clients. Um, hospitality makes up, I'd say, about 50 to 60% of our portfolio now. So if you're talking to a new restaurant or a new hotel about their strategy, or if, I mean, a lot of the time we go way beyond just talking about PR. You know, we, we find ourselves to be F&B consultants and um, concept consultants, and we love it. So we don't and mind doing it. And, social yeah. media, we do influencers, and we, we have a design team, we have content teams, we create content, but we yeah. just don't position ourselves as, like a creative agency to go up against someone who's maybe doing CAD drawings and, and, yeah. and everything. But you, you we have lead with to, comms and you understand we lead with comms, the but We understand all the parts of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, and so if you're having a conversation with someone, you need to be able to really know what you're talking about. So the whole team that are in Abu Dhabi live in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. So if someone's saying, right, we've got this brilliant new idea and we're going to open it, we can go, okay, great. You know, there's another concept like it, or we've seen this approach yeah. like crash and burn or do really well, or best ways to approach it with like your target audiences and getting into the communities. Yeah. So that works really well. Is that one of the things that you think people get wrong? They think that they can serve different markets from Dubai and that you need to kind of localize it a bit? I think it depends what you're doing. Hmm. I mean, when we moved to Abu Dhabi, it wasn't an overnight decision either. Um, it probably we spent 18 months trying to understand it, going up and kind of creating a base. So we, I always say before you make your next move, create a track record. So I think with the way that you can do anything remotely, you could be here and look after other markets as long as you understand it and you have a track record in that market. Yeah. And that's what we did um, opening up Abu Dhabi. So when we actually went to launch, we weren't there like hands empty and then realizing it didn't work. I mean, we looked at Bahrain, we wanted to go in there. I know we've had conversations and um, it just wasn't right for us. Actually, once we went on the ground, met people, ran the numbers, got to understand it. an amazing place, somewhere I would always recommend to go. Absolutely yeah. fabulous hospitality. Love it. Does it make sense for us to have an office there at the moment? No. You know, so it is looking. Um, but I do think you just have to understand. And if you can have people on the ground that are local, Um, local as in living there and being part of the community mm. uh, I think it really helps no matter what you're doing Do you focus on what makes sense for you of where you think your skills would suit the market or in terms of the opportunity of the market in terms of maybe how, much, how many other competitors are already there, the stage of the market um, I always want to bring value, so whatever we do it has to be opportunity but opportunity where we can really create value for yeah. the client. So you think basically if you're good and you have a good relationship, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. Yeah, we. it's not having blinkers on, but I've never really paid too much attention to what the agencies to the left and the right of us are doing. Yeah, There are some brilliant agencies. I mean, in 2010, also Seven Media launched, The Code launched, okay, um, really. ourselves, all in the same, yeah. same year. So we've all celebrated our 10-year anniversary oh, wow. this year. Um, and we're the ones that have stayed and now go up against the, the internationals. Yeah. But that said, it is good to have a good community and a good um, relationship with competitors, but I don't worry too much. 
not to the point of being arrogant, um, because you need to have your eyes open to some degree. Yeah. But yeah, if we're confident in what we're doing and we think it's right, we're very much like, let's go. If mm. you go full speed and go for it, it's the best way. Mm. Interesting. So uh, just you mentioned kind of pivoting into the event space and it not working. Can you talk a bit about like what didn't work, but also as communications and social media and all these things have cropped up over the last 10 years, uh, how kind of, how much do you need to pivot? How, mu- how many times do you need to add new services or... How, or how do you kind of stick to your current offering? Yeah, um, I think we've gone very kind of like up and down, but on like an upward trajectory yeah. over the 10 years, because when we launched, I think we offered everything, media planning, um, I mean, content creation, of course, graphic design, brand creation, everything. And our license, I think, still allow or does allow us to do it all. Um, but over time we learned it's better off being known and very good at one or two uh, services rather than being a jack of all trades, especially at the size that we're at. Mm. Um, We're not a a global yet um, agency with all the different sections and floors for each department and whatnot. Yeah. So I think we learned the hard way every time, to be very honest with you, of trying something, seeing it doesn't work. And that's okay. We yeah. just need to know when to pull the plug. Yeah. I think that there's nothing worse than sitting on something for too long. Or if any, if I'm ever coaching or mentoring people, they say there's no such thing as a bad decision. It's making no decision. Yeah. You know. So we did that, and then we decided, right, we really want to ramp up the event. So when you asked earlier, how did we go from events into PR, and how long did it stay? Okay, the baby showers might have gone away after eight months, but events still, yeah. and activations is still such an integral part of yeah. what we do at Qcom. Absolutely. I think we were one of the first agencies out here to do the really creative press drops mm. that used to come out to yeah. media. That wasn't just a, a press release. Yeah, you, or... you stood out on Love in Dubai in the early days. There was always the, your, your, your uh, um, gifts to the office were always the most flamboyant. Yeah, and flamboyant, creative. crazy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. gosh, we got it wrong sometimes as well. I remember we <laughs> sent out an invite once, which now is quite common. But I mean, we're going back to a huge box and you opened and a big balloon comes out. And on the invitation was the actual, or sorry, on the balloon was the invitation. And we actually okay. didn't put the location on there. Okay. So then we got loads of phone calls and then we just positioned it as like, oh no, that was That's the a teaser. That was the teaser. Exactly. <laughs> we wanted to engage you, you know. So events are really part of what we do. We work with brilliant brand so Peroni mm. you know a brand that we work with and yeah. it's a dark market it's alcohol so how yeah. do you bring that to life not using traditional a lot of it is through events yeah and experiential experiences and I always say you know like an event we do the same with Kong that first part or that first time that you communicate that first touch point sets the scene mm. so if I'm inviting you to an event um, how it looks, how it feels, the language, is it something physical or now is it something that's like a video or digital that I can engage with, share. It's just really important. So we have all those elements mm. within our comms now. And I think that's why a lot of clients really look to us and enjoy working with us because we don't go, right, here's a press release, let's get it out, which is very, it, it's the bread and butter of what we do. Mm. But it's like, how can we actually engage the audience? Mm. What's going to get people talking and, and get them excited about so, it? Just about that, you know, so basically, if someone has a PR agency on their roster, they've kind of done an RFP, they have a pitch, uh, you know, you, your services would be known in terms of what you would do for them and the value that you bring. Um, in the last 10 years, we've seen social media really become something where a lot of budget, a lot of time, and that mm. ecosystem on top of the platforms has become something. Why do you think that PR agencies uh, didn't land grab or own that? And why was there a need for a social media agency as well as a PR agency? I think... And the I, same question really about influencers as well. Yeah, I think that, that's a podcast all on itself. True. Um, I think there was a little bit of fear. And a little bit of unknown. So when we opened the office in Abu Dhabi 2016, um, Kate Grebel, who now heads up our QUK, came out and opened that office 
for us. Q UK, I like it. Q UK, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you all about that, don't worry. And um, she had come from a Manchester agency working with global brands and it was digital, digital, digital. And when she hit the ground here, she said, guys, you need to be looking more digital. Mm. And we were like, yeah, no, of course. And then we would try to sell it into clients and they would be like, but that, that's not worth spending money on mm. was a lot of the feedback we got at the time. Mm. And it was because um, I always liken social media and food because everyone has social media. Everyone's an expert and everyone feels like they um, are the authority and know how to do it. Just like food, because everyone eats and everyone cooks, they all yeah. think that they're, they're the foodies experts. and, and, and what not. <laughs> And I think it's only really in the last year or two that it's been given its its correct place in the whole marketing mix and sphere and the respect that it deserves mm. because it's completely surpassed. And I agree with you. There was an opportunity to grab that, to have it. Um, we brought in digital probably about three years ago, more seriously and invested. We have photo studios now, teams, dedicated teams. A lot of the time they speak a language that I don't always understand, but that's okay, you know. I know that's not necessarily my um, key area of expertise, but mm. that's why you build teams of brilliant mm. people. But it's still communications at the end of the day. But do you, also, do you think that social media is just like a uh, magazine? It's another medium. So in terms of PR and comms, you're actually already, in terms of the importance of a client engaging with a PR agency, uh, that uh, you you can cover that without say owning it like you know it's a new medium can have uh, new types of mm. uh, you can have new layers right so you can yeah. have um, you know as media continues you can have extra layers of agencies but the what I'm trying to get at is that you know uh, the sort of traditional skill set what you studied in university is still relevant now yeah well, yes and no. I okay. also think the degree isn't necessarily worth it. I think okay. if you want to go into comms, you just can. go in and work. I yeah, think fine. learning theory for years is okay. a big waste of time. Yeah. Not huge, not complete, but yeah. you know, but that's a, again, different conversation. I just think PR and things like this, social, digital, hmm. it's so live and it changes so much that it's only once you're in there and you're doing it, you'll really understand. What, what was your biggest win? What's your biggest, the moment where you got so excited? Um, we've had quite a few over the years. I think winning Burj Al Arab right, as, yeah. a, as a local agency, and this is going back again about four years ago, and that, that was when they were kind of moving away from what they had been since, since they launched and quite a little bit stiff, shall we say, you know, stuffy, and wanting to be a bit more accessible. And that's when we launched the terrace, yeah. went on the back, um, Nathan Outlaw, brilliant chef, Dan Mahara, gold on 27. So you really were part of that changing, that perception yeah, around Burjana. Yeah, part of that change Amazing. perception. How do we bring it? How do we launch this to yeah. a crowd that, um, like t to the Dubai crowd? I think internationally it always stands there and it's iconic. But when the hotel opened and anyway, even when I moved here in 2007, so, the, the way things were structured here were different. Everything revolved around the hotel. Mm. But then after that, DIFC opened, independent restaurants opened, and the social scene changed hugely. That it wasn't that where you go and where you socialized was within a hotel anymore. Mm. So then those hotel-owned concepts really had to either rethink how they approach it or start to approach independence to manage it on their behalf. And yeah. that's why now we have such a plethora of amazing clients, um, clients like and restaurant people, options yeah. here yeah. In, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and, and in the region. Mm. Um, so we were very much part of that process of them saying, right, if we want to appeal and compete with the local market here and be more than just occasion driven, we mm. need to start talking in a different way. Yeah. Um, but going back to your layers thing, so that's a great example. When we did do something like Burj Al Arab, we were there, we were engaged for PR. Yeah. But what we do and what we do regularly or, or with all our clients is even if social or digital isn't part of our remit, and it is, we've exclusively digital clients as well and social clients, we will say how this would look on their assets or mm. how they can roll that out. So if we either hand that over to the digital agency, we like to work in hand in hand or in-house, but it's just showing that we look at all the elements of this campaign. Mm. So if we're communicating 
we're thinking beyond, okay, well, what does that mean with media or, I mean, PR at the end of the day is reputation building and management. Mm. So your own assets and social are, are key for that because that's what people look to first. Yeah. And you've um, got very nice socials. I must comment to like your, your content's really good. <laughs> Thank very, you. A clean look, very kind of professionally done. It, do you know what? It's always a thing of we can't go out and preach and tell mm. people how to do things if we don't look after ourselves too. But yeah. as as with every business, you look after your own bits last. But we, <laughs> we're doing much better at that. Thank speaking you. of speaking of that messaging, this year started. You posted a video of that you're bringing the whole team on holiday to, oh, to Zanzibar. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was probably the best thing in the office ever. Yeah. Ever, yeah. So you were celebrating together. Everyone was excited, and then. Of course, things didn't... Then the C word. <laughs> the C word. Then the C word happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my gosh, this has been one hell of a roller coaster of year for everyone, you mm. know? Um, but we really went into this year thinking this this is our year. Yeah. Um, we launched uh, QUK last month in July. And you had um, been planning that probably? But we've been planning that since the end of 2019. So that was actually okay. planned for March. We announced that for our 10 year anniversary, we're going to take the whole team to Zanzibar for the weekend because we always say it and, and we really live and breathe it. Our best asset is our team, you know, and so we didn't want it. We wanted to do something that we could all enjoy together to really celebrate the hard work yeah. over the years. We had just come off the back of investing about a year's worth of time, money into the team, changing everything. So we're working on HR apps that we have from America that we localized to be in line with labor laws here. And we just introduced uh, ICAS, which is an employee support system with access to psychologists, financial planners, Amazing. everything for them and their families. We launched QCARES, which is our charity initiative. And wow. we did our first quarter for the Philippines. We actually had a trip to the orphanage plant. Like there was just so much mentoring programs and um, it was brilliant and you could really feel it like it yeah. paid off that really listening to the team we do employee surveys like what is it that you want what's okay. going to really keep you motivated because there's so many different factors that motivate a team yeah so to, and it was nice. hard you you have to ask some hard questions to get to that point mm. you know um it's easier not to put your head in the sand but so 18 months ago we went through a very difficult period of, of have hearing some home truths of, of what we thought was maybe working really well but it wasn't there was a mis disconnect or miscommunication to the team got everything on board really on track and then COVID hit yeah and it was a whirlwind I think we lost easily by 80 percent of our business in a two to three week period Wow. And we have a diversified portfolio. That you know? obviously has never happened before. <laughs> it's never happened. No, you no weren't relying on one client it. either. No, yeah. I mean, very early on, I think about year two, year three, we'd made that mistake that we had our set of clients mm. and thought we were doing great. And then suddenly realized... It just come up to... Like, chain. wait a minute, yeah. you know, contracts coming to an end yeah. or whatnot. And we learned very early on, you'd never stop pitching. You never stop growing. Yeah. Um, you, you always are looking for where you might need that next piece of need uh, yeah. maybe the wrong word but that have that next piece of business lined up so you don't leave yourself exposed is our pr contracts the same as sort of media contracts are they one year or four years or how often would it just depends it really depends um but you traditionally you're looking at 12 month or 24 month um, and there might contracts. be a pitch or it would be auto renewal or it depends uh, on the relationship. A lot of the time, it depends on the relationship. If it's government, so we have quite a few government contracts too, they tend to be longer, mm. um, 10 years, but then there's auto renewal clauses or you go up to pitch again. Yeah. Good relationship helps a lot, but it's not a guarantee. Yeah, because you always have to be on your toes anyway. You yeah. always have to be on your toes. You always have to be delivering the best and, and be genuine and authentic. Mm. Um, I always say to the team too, we haven't been brought on board to be yes people. We say yes to everything in the sense <laughs> of the attitude of come, we can get things done. Yeah. But if if a client is making a wrong judgment call on a strategy or a comms, it's it's our job to yeah. say no. We you really to, advise and, yeah. and to really coach and counsel. Yeah, and really they important. they would value that. Uh, maybe when they're when their clients might have a number of agencies, if you're the one that's on this then they trust you more and they come to you yeah. more. Yeah, but I do think that honesty comes more with time. So it's normally once okay. you're working because there's trust 
there's a lot of trust that goes in there. Yeah. We are looking after um, a brand's reputation. And, and it depends, again, if you're talking and if you're dealing with an international yeah. or, or huge, so like Voss Water, Reebok that you mentioned. I mean, we have some brilliant brands that we work with. Yeah. Um, you are talking to the teams versus if you're talking to someone and it's their business. So they're the one who started from the, the ground up. So there's trust levels, there's different types of trust levels and how much you can advise and not. So you really have to tailor it to the client each time. But you, you did survive through this period. Everything, you know, the, the new office UK launched. Yes. And maybe some of those plans are on hold, but what's your kind of view on sort of the future? So when everything um, started kicking off around March, as I mentioned before, that's when we had thought, it was actually end of Feb, we started to feel it already. We thought, right, let's put everything on hold because we just have to kind of understand what's going on. And then um, as we realized that this isn't a three week, four week thing, or it's not going anywhere, we need to think of what is our game plan and our action plan mm. moving forward. So we decided to go ahead and launch Q UK because it's actually a brilliant time to launch it. I mean, we launched Q in 2010 in the recession then. Mm. This is very different. It affects people differently, but it was a great time. I mean, we've launched and we've already got five clients, wow. soon to be six by the time hopefully I finish this, wow. <laughs> which is hitting the ground running. Yeah. But like I said, there was a lot of work in the background and there's a lot of synergy with the clients that we have here and there. So I think looking at the, the positives, not stopping and not kind of like it's tempting just to, to kind of go in a little bit and go, gosh, I think we allowed ourselves about a week of that, of just <laughs> shock. Like that, yeah. And then it, it's our responsibility. It's our baby and the team, you know, if we want to be leaders and, and I'm always wary using that word because we really do see ourselves all in the same, but you know, they look, they look to you. So you have a week of, okay. And oh gosh. And, and the things that, you know, all the terrible thoughts, like I said, 10 years of work just gone down drain. What's the exit plan? Is there an exit plan? What do we do? How do we look after everyone? And then you go, no, actually this is doable. Mm. And, um, I think people want candor rather than charisma mm. during that, that period. We were very open, very honest with the team. Great. We really thought about what we were saying every time before we said it, um, just so we were clear. It's mm. not a time for confusion. And we did everything personally. So mm. every single person, we did check-ins on Zoom for myself and Elsa. We have a brilliant HR department. We've got a great team of directors, but we just felt like, this is us communicating hands on and the, the reaction from the team they were so gracious it was it was overwhelming but i think that's more testament to the to the work that had gone on before was is it your biggest challenge you faced the last so, few months yeah easily easily now i'm like throw anything at us we're yeah. good to go I, I think yeah. it's there's so many elements because I, I mean i remember saying to elsa at one stage or both of us discussing it um because i'm very lucky elsa's my best friend as well so we're best friends before we started this going if and you're that, and running the relationship has survived the it 10 has years. It, it's everyone incredible. told us <laughs> don't, don't, do don't do it <laughs> everyone said don't do yeah. it but i suppose that's why we're in the position we're in we are quite um strong-minded once we know what it is that we're doing yeah. best decision we ever did wow um you know that we said if we were running these type of numbers in a normal scenario you just would not keep the business going like this and you would have to make some serious cuts quickly yeah but because it, this is so unique and it's not and also i think living here and I've, I've tried to explain this to international friends and colleagues is living in the uae is different that there wasn't furlough schemes there wasn't support in place um for people and there was unknown but also living here is attached to a visa hmm. so if you do have to make cuts you're not just maybe putting someone out of a job mm, you're potentially taking them. away yeah. their home yeah which puts a whole other level of it's true responsibility of responsibility yeah. and emotional responsibility i think it's been very tough from that aspect of just carrying it knowing that the decisions might have impact or will have impact and the emotional toll so you had to do a little bit differently but we just found regular contact updating we just did another cons um, survey with the team and they were saying communication direction is still mm. at the forefront of what they need at the moment but then we also had to look at what was best for the 
the full team. Yeah. And um, business luckily has started to come back. I think since July we've started to notice. We feel like there's a lot of things set up and people are still just a little bit hesitant to cross the line. But summer is here. Traditionally, a bit of a downtime anyway. So yeah. now you're starting to go, well, is it COVID? Is it just a normal summer pattern? Yeah. So, yeah. But it's, I mean, we've, we've changed things around. We, we do four-day weeks now. Yeah. We just realized through this, I think, time. We adapted a few things. Adapted a few things. Yeah. Where can, you know, what's important to the team? I think people did pick up some great new habits during COVID. And, Such and, as? Well, you know, working out or cooking. Oh, yeah, or, true, You know yeah. what I mean? Like the yeah. team. So we want to be able to give them time. Yeah. Self-care. Yeah. And just like what's important. So we're on a four-day work week for now. And just Amazing. different things to try and make it work. Hmm. while we build back up hmm. i mean i think now we're very focused we know what we're doing we redid our end of year goals we're doing our first team meeting again great on the 2nd of september but again it's to making sure that um people are comfortable hmm. it's also listening you know because we may be ready to to go at it full full force but there might be individuals who don't feel comfortable working in the office yet yeah. we just have to listen and, and do it case by case we have clients that come visit us we do a lot of client meetings still on zoom or teams for you and Asa, do you have a support network through the years or you know speaking about gender your female mm. business owners independence uh you know there aren't that many or there haven't been yeah. uh you know we know from this podcast it's hard to find people in your position uh, to interview, uh, how has that been? Has it, has it, was it ever a thing? Oh, this is much harder for me. Did you ever feel like that, or? Um, no, no. To be very honest with you, I think more maybe not having Arabic is more what I, I've thought at, at moments. If anything, I think we've managed to use it to our advantage at times. Um, you also offer Arabic. PR to your clients. Yeah, of sorry. Yeah, we have a full Arabic team. I meant yeah. on a personal note. Yeah, 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 yeah. Speak <laughs> Arabic. Um, yeah, no, I think being two women in business, it, it gives you a bit more fire, hmm. you know. It, point of difference sometimes. It's point of difference. It works for us and it works against us yeah. at times. And I think that's... How would just, it work against you? Well, sometimes there is that old boys club or hmm. they do want, you know, like if we, we do work um, across so many sectors and sometimes sports. So we do some things in the sporting arena too. But if there's not a, a, a man going in for that pitch okay. or some of those meetings, stereotypes the getting away. There is a little bit. I mean, it, yeah. it changes. So I don't want to kind of clump it and say that's what we've faced over the years. Yeah. But I also feel like there's enough business there. Yeah. To satisfy all the different types. I mean, I think in about year four, year five, I was talking with another um, business owner who really said, you need to get a guy up top like it's part of your um, directors and that'll really help bring you to the next level. And then we really explored it and we interviewed it, we put, we placed someone, but then it, it just didn't work that time around. But what we've kind of learned over the years more so is it really doesn't come down to gender. It's all about the person, okay. the right mindset. Good. Are they passionate? Um, do they embody the values of Q? Yeah. Do they fit with the culture? And, you know, play to the strengths that we have it. That said, I'd say we're about 45, 55% um, male to female okay. in the agency. So that okay. side you is well represented. Well represented. <laughs> Great. Yeah, <laughs> so you have, it, yeah, not that it matters, but yeah, but it's interesting. Uh, but just going back to that kind of role model, like, did you think that there weren't, is there someone who you look up to in your industry? Uh, uh, or uh, as a female business owner elsewhere that you kind of go oh well they did it mm. or is or do you even look at gender at all don't really look at gender um, I get asked this question a lot and have heated discussions when I say I don't necessarily have a role model okay. people go well, how is that possible and I'm like well there's people that I go oh I like that or I admire that and I, you know people like Richard Branson are no brainers but then again Everything that's gone on recently makes me now put that into question because we look at a lot of um, personas versus mm. people. Mm. You know, I think someone like Donna Benson here is a great story. Yeah. But I don't know her personally well enough to go into it. But, you know, someone I say, okay, look, that's fantastic what she's done. Mm. Um, 
So there are people, there's more individuals that I've met over the years yeah. that I think I can learn a lot from. Yeah. And are, are yeah. That was, of course, entertaining, which would have started around the same time as you were starting. So it's a similar sort of growth trajectory. And, yeah. 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 I think she started earlier than us. And, you know, she was really that going door to door selling yeah. it, the whole, yeah. you know, yeah. bottom up. No, it's great. It's great. And it, it just shows that, you know, for young people starting out in the industry that they don't need to, you know, that kind of glass ceiling, they don't need to kind of think that there's barriers against them if you guys could do it. No, definitely not. I think especially here, there's actually a lot of opportunities as a woman. There's a lot of mm. um, female, net, like exclusively female networking. Yeah clubs which yeah. I sometimes think is a bit unfair to the men you know? <laughs> um, no, there, there is that you know that niche of, point, yeah. of kind of singling out individuals that are because they're female you know and and celebrating yeah. them a bit more and um, Muna Al Gurg is you know someone that I definitely would yeah. ad, you know admire and think she's done some fantastic is things. that with 2452 in Abu Dhabi or is that here is she here Muna Al Gurg she's here Media. yes Al Gurg okay um group um, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. So um, two four fifty four. There's there's great people up yeah. there. Um, yeah. I follow them on on Instagram. So I always yeah. think of their their Instagram handles. Is probably not the best way to to name them. <laughs> well, Dubai Party Queen. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I didn't. I'm going to put you on the spot. I didn't uh, tell you we were going. I'm going to ask you this type of question. But uh, PR industry in Dubai mm-hmm. stories that shocked you over the years. Was there you know you know off the top of your head like. When, when you look at things, were there any times that you've kind of had to do crisis management? Uh, were there any things that you kind of go, uh-oh? <laughs> and, uh, you know, how do you think that people's perception has changed with kind of shocking stories and stuff yeah. like that? I think, um, yeah, we've definitely done crisis comms. We've done crisis comms on, I mean, we've done crisis comms on press trips where things have happened and we've done crisis comms for brands here. Uh, naturally, I can't really talk about them because that's what they paid us for was to keep everything <laughs> quiet. Yeah. But um, it, look, it has changed. It used to be that you were almost protected because there was a level of censorship within the media, whether you want it, whether they say that was the case or not, it was, you know. And seven days was the go-to for anything that was a little bit more sensational. Yeah. And even that is pushing it for what would really be some, like internationally would not class yeah. as such. Um, I think with digital, I mean, during COVID, everyone turned to digital anyway because it's the easiest way in social to access content in real time versus waiting for scheduled um, news reports on the radio or on the TV or whatever it might be. It's all there. So things get out much quicker and it's a bit harder to, to manage. There are days where I wake up and I think, oh, I'm so happy I'm not their PR agency and then but there are also days when I go I wish I yeah. could get my teeth into that because crisis comms is quite a different skill set and it's um quite um it can be quite exhilarating as long as it's nothing that's obviously putting harm to people hmm. but yeah it's been some shockers like, I mean zero gravity okay yeah <laughs> you know the pool but the memes the next day yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah it's entertaining Brilliant. Uh, yeah, as long as the business doesn't suffer. But I think how they manage that, for example, they came out with a message and things like that. Like, you know, when you talk about censorship, there's sort of, um, I guess there's guidelines, which is, which is you know, uh, things to be respectful to entities, people, uh, and then also, you know, customs. Yeah. Uh, and then there's also, uh, you know, the economy and what we're trying to achieve here all together. But then there's the other part of it, which is I, I what I think is um, a go to sort of delete button, which, you know, you know, if something goes live in other markets, it's screenshot and it's live. Whereas here there seems to be a kind of, oh, they'll take it down. Mm. Do, do you think that still is a have you come across that? Though? What's your view on it? Or do you think that if something goes up, do you advise people to try and keep it quiet or do you advise them to uh, put out a press release? Um. Neither, in a way. Okay. I tell them to embrace it. I think this idea of kind of going, oh, if I close my eyes, and yeah. it's not in this market, it'll go away. Yeah. It's it's not good. Also, you need to be on the front foot. So with crisis comms, be proactive, not reactive. Okay. Don't sit there and be like, 
is it going to come what's going to come it depends on the degree of what it is as well yeah. you know it might be something that was overlooked but have your holding statements have your messaging have everything ready mm. but if it's something that's a bit bigger and especially during everything with covid people need to feel informed mm. you know not holding information back so i think being proactive with crisis comms is really important but that is where you do need to get someone in to help and the thing is the crisis comms it only works very well i mean there'll be obviously um instances here and there that you might get away with it if it's stuff that's been done before because it's what your brand stands for it's your messaging it's what you stand for that you bring through in these moments of crisis so whoever is going to be guiding you your agency or if it's an in-house role uh, needs to really understand the brand and already have those scenarios already mapped out mm. within your industry you can normally tell what potential scenarios you could be yeah you could be facing yeah yeah and that obviously kind of spills over into social media and you have to respond quickly and all this stuff. social media how you respond yeah. it's it's so important you can also spin it so we launched um what was a dubai institution society yeah years years back for those who don't know it's a very frequented nightclub i yeah. think in the city it's not there at the moment anymore it's not, it changed names it's or... changed yeah it closed and, it, and a new concept's open yeah but that was originally meant to open in the address here in Dubai Marina. Yeah. And we put in the original press release that you could dance on the tables. There okay. was a table that you could dance on because the table was actually going to be that far off the ground. Yeah. And we got full approvals, everything on this. It went out. Arabian Business ran it. Um, all the, the this was uh, pre-loving, I think. In a, in a, in a way where... Like, I, I, I okay. a bit sensationalized, a bit okay. of outrage, but also bit fantastic something okay. a bit meaty to write about okay. and um yeah got in trouble so much so that the venue got wow. kicked out of that hotel wow and so there was an opportunity do you kind of go gosh and were we fired and then you know taken off and they went and opened somewhere else they did open somewhere else, but we said we can use this to your advantage. Yeah. We've already created the name, ripples the brand, and yeah. the names of doing things a little bit different. It doesn't different. really matter where it is because someone's been. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now let's open and let's keep that going. Yeah. And we did. And it was so successful. Yeah, 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 yeah. And did a lot of firsts in the city. I remember, yeah. And it, it was, went well. It was the first one to bring bingo here and, yeah. and all the different types. It was pre-loving, actually. I remember going to it pre-loving. Yeah. <laughs> we went to it during loving as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that's like a... It's a softer crisis situation, yeah. but it's not that soft if it's your business and you've invested yeah. and you could potentially be losing like a big um, a lease contract. Then, it, you know, it's important to the to the individuals involved. Mm. So it's just looking at it, but responding well quickly. And, you know, I was on the phone with the, the said editors who were very kind and did things to help me fix a little bit. And, but it was out there then. So mm. the pirates were already out sold, there. So. Yeah interesting good one to, to to think about um good advice just about you know how you're working with clients like we talk about the services but at what point do you kind of help people to be more transparent i've, I've got some uh, idea i've got an um, example in my head because i watched the 12 minute video this morning uh of uh gym shark in the uk mm. uh this uh startup gym company clothing gear do you know yeah. yeah you know okay and he's been like bought for a billion yeah, yeah. so so but how he so it was covered on lab bible and stuff like that and someone told me a few weeks ago i i've just been oblivious to this gym shark growth brands like like um you know under armor whatever it's just taken off like mm. um pretty little thing or, or these type of yeah. um you know active wear type companies but I was just, I watched the video at leisure, at leisure, leisure thank you. yeah. you're just off the back of a Reebok pitch, so you're well, well <laughs> up with the lingo. <laughs> very true, very true. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, so because it kind of, the press kind of got my attention, I watched the video and I was, in, I was blown away because it, he was so transparent. There's graphs of the share ownership, there's all the decisions, there's talking about his his co-founder that left and started. And I just thought like, wow, like you're either... Mm transparent all the way or someone's worked with you on this piece which is really really impressive yeah um, and it alone that video alone can do 
can go so far, far now, you know, because it's got everything in it, as opposed to uh, as opposed to multiple relationships and different sorts of um, what do you think? What do you think of that? Like, does it come from the company? Does it come from the agency? He's um, he's quite young, isn't he? Yeah, which is also why it made such headlines. I think it's a bit of a generational thing, too. If you think about just how communications comms has evolved from our parents' generation to our generation to our younger siblings, <laughs> we're not even going to go as far as the next generation yet. I think um, it's not as like the my team. I see it, and um, consumers they they share. They almost overshare, mm. as we say. So this transparency, even if it's not always showing the right things, they're very used to that idea of showing and 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 being open, which is kind of very different to what it would have been two generations beforehand, where it was you know in the office closed door boardrooms mm. so I think that's part of where this transparency comes from it's a generational mindset of how they like to communicate and and like to do things mm. I think you just need to get the right balance of transparency because you open yourself up for a lot of scrutiny but that's not always a bad thing mm. it all comes back to and I think this period and this year again is being authentic and being genuine mm. So I think people understand now if they've got something that's too packaged and too marketed and too on message and going out. Um, I think was it Ford, so one of the car companies, like had this big fancy advert ready to roll in March for March Madness in the States and just decided to let it roll anyway and had mm. to be pulled back out of poor taste. Yeah. So I think it is doing that thing of just being like considered aware. aware and not too polished. Mm. People want a bit of grit. I think mm. people want to see behind, and that's why social is brilliant, because you can be the head of a company and then also show your personal life. I think Bill Walsh, Viceroy Hotels, does a great job of that. Viceroy, mm. go brands, he's Irish okay. as well. And yeah. um, if you follow his Instagram, you get a real insight to the brand, but an insight to him. Yeah, and it makes you kind of buy into it all a okay. little bit more because it's getting right balance. Yeah. yeah, and you used to work with Tourism Ireland as well, and all those. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and you're wearing green today. Representing. I am. I am. <laughs> I realised that as you said, I'm yeah. like a very on brand. So why didn't you open Q Dublin? Doesn't Q Ireland doesn't have the same ring as Q UK? <laughs> it, it will. I mean, look, it's definitely something we'd be looking at. It would have been a natural step as well, being mm. Irish. Um, but again. It comes down to the people. Mm. So we've been looking, like I said, we looked at Bahrain. We're still looking into Saudi. Um, but we trust Kate. We understand the market. It's a key feeder market for a lot of our hospitality clients. And the Middle East is a key feeder market for the UK mm. and Europe, which is kind of easier to would, service in there. For you and Elsa, obviously, if you wanted to move, not saying that you would move, but mm. Saudi's closer than the UK. Would Arabic be the barrier, or, or why not uh, QCOMs in, in Saudi? Um, I think it's more when than, than why not. Yeah. Um, Arabic, no, I wouldn't say Arabic is, it's a little bit the barrier, but not, not too much. Mm. Um, I think you've got to remember, though, that it's still the American. ability for women to go in and out freely yeah. was always kind of... Um, True hindered yeah you know it's only that's only for anyone changed. you needed an invitation letter yeah. it was lots of things and for women of course yeah so i think and again it comes back to just really understanding the market mm. because i wouldn't want to put someone in somewhere or just appoint someone or partner with someone just for the sake of going tick and then Look, we, have, we have a flag yeah yeah like because because that only goes so far and then when you can't deliver or the quality is not correct it's going to come back and yeah. bite you you need, um, you need a real business unit in each market, not just the, Yeah. yeah okay. I mean, we have teams that we work with on the ground across the GCC. You like have some clients in those markets. We have clients and we have individuals. Yeah. So we work with them on an ongoing basis. Yeah. And I'd more want to build something up with one of them. But it takes time. Yeah. Kate, somebody came, opened up our um, Abu Dhabi office and really understood what Q's all about. Went back. We always had our eye on the UK put two years back in the market, building back up the contacts because she's been over in the Middle East. Strategic, Katie. Very strategic. <laughs> so then when, it, we, when we wanted to launch 
we have yeah. substance. Yeah, definitely. And, and we have the network. So, so it just made sense for us and it's been a really good decision so far. Great. Um, so to wrap up, because I'm conscious that Ari is almost up, uh, the, just to, we almost touched on it there, you, 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 the region. So I always ask this question about uh, the Middle East as an emerging market. Uh, do you see it as an emerging market? What do you see the barriers are? Or where are we in five, ten years' time? I think the speed that we're going at, I mean, it's exciting to think about where we are in five, ten years' time. Um, but there, there's always unrest, unfortunately, mm. you know, which I think maybe scares or intimidates people in other parts of the world. I still think there's a massive misconception about the Middle East and some of the questions I get asked mm. um, from international people I'm always surprised at mm. but it's it, a lot of it's to do with media but I think everything especially the UAE what we're doing from the the Mars Hope probe mm. to, to everything it's putting us on more and more the international stage is the whole region emerging no I think there's parts of it that have definitely matured beyond that and mm. are real global players which we know yeah um, not all parts of the region, but yeah, getting there. Do, but do you think uh, do you think the unrest will always hold here back, or or do you think from a business point of view, from a, an industry point of view, that there is sort of uh, hope for you know pan Arab PR companies, networks, clients? Oh, completely. Um, I was I watched a little clip of from the gentleman from Hockey. Yeah. And I really liked what he said about Arabic being a unifying language. And yeah, it's true, it's which is point, quite right, different. Yeah. But at the same time, you don't fall into the trap of one size fits all. Yeah. So we did a campaign with an agency in Egypt for DHL that we won an award for with Mo Salah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which that was, was brilliant. fantastic. Yeah. But, you know, the, the market there is completely different in how you communicate to them. The way that we communicate in KSA is different to how we communicate in Kuwait. So, like, there's nuances in the culture, in, in how people consume media, yeah. how the Arabic is written. So, 100% pan-Arab agencies, but you need to have a foot and an understanding in the market. Okay. Just like from here to Abu Dhabi. Yeah, okay. great. Well, that's, that's brilliant. Great. Thanks a lot, Katie. And, and, yeah, speak soon. Thank you for having me. Bye. Hey guys, I'm Richard Fitzgerald. This is Dubai Works, where we interview the business leaders making a difference in this great city. That business with scalability was very interesting to me. I like building something that has legacy.